Okay, I think we're here. This is the case of Hoti versus Musk. And if I could have the uh, appearance of counsel, please, starting with the appellant. Good afternoon, Your Honors. Michael Lifrak from Quinn Emanuel for the defendant and appellant, Elon Musk. Okay, thank you, Mr. Lifrak. Good afternoon, Your Honors. D. Gil Sperline on behalf of Randeep Hoti. Thank you, Mr. Sperline. All right, Mr. Liefrak, you're up first, and uh, you've heard us say it before. We've read the briefs. We understand the issues. We don't need you to repeat yourself, so get right to your main arguments. And um, if I could uh, start you off, I, I would just say that uh, we, we may um, agree with your idea that the comments here uh, may have – it may be a long road to, road to get uh, – road to hoe to get victory, ultimately, based on those comments. But what about these comments um, are not, or about what about these comments are a matter of public uh, importance? Yes, Your Honor. And if I could reserve three minutes or so for rebuttal, you may. Possible? You may. Thank you. Uh, and may it please the court. In my remarks, I'd like to focus on two issues, one of which uh, Presiding Justice Humes just mentioned, that we believe represent the clearest errors of law by the trial court and that are dispositive of Mr. Musk's anti slap motion. And the first is what Your Honor just mentioned, and whether there is a sufficient nexus between Mr. Musk's statements, the challenge statements on one hand, and something that was an issue of public interest and a public controversy on the other hand, because that determines, number one, whether the anti slap statute applies, and number two, whether or not Mr. Hothi has a, uh, the burden of showing constitutional malice for his defamation claim. And the second issue that I'd like to address, if we have time to do it, is whether or not Mr. Hothi, in fact, did provide sufficient evidence of constitutional malice. And if the well, court makes Mr. those Lefrak, two findings... Mr. Lefrak, um, yes, I am failing to see how these statements are related to a matter of public interest. Okay, and, I, and I'll, I'll get right to that then. And so I think the first step in that is to identify what the matters of public interest are. And the matters of public interest that were being debated publicly were a couple of things. And it's number one, it was being debated publicly about Tesla's factory output and whether Tesla was being accurate about the, the number of cars it was producing. Number two, there were public debates and public controversies over Tesla's technology. And, there, and the third thing was that there were public issues about Mr. Musk's leadership of the company. And there's no question that Mr. Hothi, and this is the next step really in the analysis, that Mr. Hothi injected himself into those controversies. He said very publicly on Twitter, essentially, Mr. Musk and, and Tesla are lying about those things. They're lying about their factory output. They're lying about their technology. And in fact, Mr. Musk shouldn't be leading the company. He should go to jail. So now Mr. to Mr. the Lifford. exact question that the, the court asked, which is what is the connection between Mr. Musk's statements and those issues? So we have Mr. Hothi making these statements that Tesla and Mr. Musk were lying about, allegedly lying about these things. And what Mr. Musk is saying is, Look at what Mr. Hothi did to come to those conclusions. What he did was not legitimate. He harassed Tesla employees. He was trespassing on Tesla property. He hit an employee with a car. And that goes to, that contributes to and furthers the public debate on the issues that I've talked about because it goes to whether or not Mr. Hothi's work is reliable whether he's a neutral arbiter of the facts or not, whether his work should be credited or not. Mr. Lifrak, Musk isn't saying something Mr. that... Lifrak, yes. Um, it sounds like, to me, these comments go to uh, whether somebody was injured or almost killed by the actions of Mr. Hody when he uh, apparently part of his car touched the knee of a security guard and then following the Tesla test car. But I don't see how that has anything to do with factory output, technology, or must leadership. 
it goes to whether Mr. Hothi's statements on that should be credited by the people who are hearing all of this information. Of course, if Mr. Musk had said a direct response to Mr. Hothi, in fact, yes, we are putting out this number of cars. Yes, our technology does work. Obviously, that would be related. But this, too, goes to the issue of whether people should believe Mr. Hothi and his claims about Tesla. I'm paraphrasing Thomas Jefferson, but he said... Can I ask? I mean, it's... What if Mr. Musk had did an ad hominem attack or some personal attack, like, Mr. Hothi is an idiot? Right. Under your argument, you would seem to suggest that that is also furthering public discourse because it's raising questions about whether he should be relied on for his own statements as to these matters of public concern. Aren't you just getting really attenuated in this justification for what is actually being stated and whether there's a sufficient link there? I would agree, Your Honor, if Mr. Musk said something like, unrelated, Mr. Hothi does not pay his taxes or he has a substance abuse problem or something like that. That wouldn't be sufficiently... There wouldn't be a sufficient nexus between that and the issues that are being debated publicly. And by the same token, if Mr. Hothi had not made these public statements and hadn't come into the arena and made these arguments and alleged that Tesla is lying about them, and then Mr. Musk made these same exact statements, I don't think there'd be a sufficient nexus there, too. But the situation here is different because Mr. Hothi is making public statements about these things. He is entering the arena. And once he does that, he opens himself up to criticism. And how he got to his conclusions and what he did to come to his conclusions, I think similarly is something that is a topic that furthers and contributes to the public debate on this. But the comment that's the basis of this lawsuit is that he almost killed some Tesla employees. So he's objecting to that comment saying, I didn't almost kill any... That was a malicious comment. I wasn't trying or I didn't try to kill somebody. And so I'm going to sue over this. Whether or not he tried to kill someone and whether or not that's a true or defamatory statement seems very far afield from the idea that... Of the ideas that you're talking about that are a matter of public interest. Right. And to be clear, the statements that Mr. Musk made is that Mr. Hothi was harassing Tesla employees and that he almost killed one of them. And I do want to take a moment to address the almost killed point because almost killed is not a false statement of fact in this situation. If I am walking down the sidewalk and I step off the curb and a car whizzes by me and then I call my spouse up and say, hey, I was almost killed. That's not a false statement of fact. That is just a hyperbolic statement. Doesn't that just mean that you might win the lawsuit? That's true. But I think the ultimate issue that's before the court now is whether the anti-slap statute applies. And we do believe that calling into question what Mr. Hothi did to come to his conclusions that he published on Twitter does further the debate. If, for example, if there was a reporter, for example, who publishes an investigative piece on a politician, obviously an issue of public importance, a public issue, does the politician, the target of that speech, have the right to then say, well, that reporter, he or she supports my opponent or he or she came to one of my rallies and harassed my supporters? Under the trial court's order, the answer would be no, because that's about the reporter or Mr. Hothi here, not about the general issue. But in our view, questioning Mr. Hothi's what he did does contribute to and further the issue of whether to believe him. And it's not an issue that's so far attenuated like Justice Sanchez brought up. It is directly related because it is directly related to the issues that Mr. Hothi worked on and participated in those public debates. And I think ultimately the problem here is that we'd be having, somebody would be having a debate between these two people and they'd be both playing under different rules because you have Mr. Hothi who's making criticisms of Tesla, 
making public claims, and he's protected by the anti-SLAPP statute. He's protected by a constitutional malice requirement if somebody sues him for defamation. But on the other hand, if the trial court's uh, reasoning is accepted, the target of that speech, when he responds in the way he chooses to respond, he would not be protected. He would not have the same protection. I mean, I think that the difficulty, Mr. LeFact, that I have is you're basing a lot of this on this notion that Mr. Hoti entered the public sphere, and so therefore some comments related to Mr. Hoti necessarily tie into a matter of public concern. If, if Musk had said something about Mr. Hoti's methodology and you're cherry-picking data and that's why he's incorrect about production levels, then I think you might have a clearer nexus to something that's a matter of public concern. But to what my colleagues are saying, if, if you're talking about almost killing someone on, on, on the, in the parking lot, it, it's difficult to see how that itself relates closely enough to the, to the concern. Here's my question. The, the, there are cases after the Philmon Supreme Court's decision, such as Wilson, that would seem to go against you where, you know, even if you have a journalist uh, who, who is terminated, that in and of itself is not enough of a matter of public concern to raise a question under anti slap why, why is this less attenuated than, than in the Wilson case? Because the issue here is not, it, you know, the issue here is these public issues of public interest that, that we've talked about that Mr. Hothi has expressed opinions on. And so what Mr. Musk's statements relate to are saying, let's take the example of, of trespassing at the factory and hitting somebody with the car. The issue is that it goes to Mr. Hothi, whether that's a legitimate, whether he has engaged in a legitimate investigation, whether his work is legitimate, because it goes directly to what he did in his participation in these public debates. If it were something completely attenuated from what he did and what he, what uh, his involvement in it, then I agree with you, Justice Sanchez, but it relates directly to his actions in doing the investigation that's at issue, that the public is going to decide whether to believe or not. And we believe it's relevant to that analysis to see and to be able to provide evidence in terms of what he did. And, and, and trespassing on property and hitting an employee is not a legitimate investigation. He should not be credited. And that should be protected in terms of a response when somebody makes allegations that you and your company are lying to the public. Okay, um, you still have a couple minutes left for replies, so why don't we turn it over to uh, your opponent. Mr. Sperling, uh, you're on mute. Sorry about that, I didn't want oh, to just you you with background noise. <clears throat> Good afternoon, your honors, and may it please the court. Um, it seems like uh, the court is very focused on a singular issue here, which is really the fundamental issue. So I'll try to uh, focus on that as well. <clears throat> um, and I think all of the justices uh, have expressed some um, skepticism about how these uh, um, accusations are tied to the, the issues of uh, public importance. And I think that's exactly right. Um, and I think a case that um, that Mr. Musk brought up in his reply, I believe for the first time, really kind of highlights uh, the difference here. This is the case of Nadell versus Regents. And in that case, there was a public debate about some, uh, I think it was volleyball courts that were going to be installed. And the people that were opposed to it were engaging in violence. They said they were going to engage in violence and um, and... Indeed, that's what the uh, regents of the university ultimately claimed and, and what was the defamatory statements. There, the whole issue was about the violence. That was, that was the public debate. Here, there's no public debate. No one except for the individuals who were immediately involved with these alleged incidents have any interest in, uh, in whether... For example, Mr. Hoti actually struck 
uh, the security guard or not. I don't think that's going to change anybody's opinion on his uh, credibility either. Um, one other thing that I want to get in quickly here too is really something that I just thought of as we were talking about this. These two incidents that Mr. Uh, Musk was referring to happened after the public debate and, and the um, Hoti had done his news gathering and reported on most of the things that he reported publicly and had an interest in. The, the, the idea of the um, safety of the car and the, um, and the production numbers. Um, three days after the highway incident, uh, Tesla filed the petition for a, a harassment order against Mr. Hoti. And he hasn't been involved in, a public, in, in any public debate since then. <clears throat> And, and the point, and, and that doesn't mean that he doesn't become a uh, person of, of limited um, public importance for those um, uh, issues that he's addressed. But the point I'm trying to make is that the highway incidents, for example, had nothing to do with how he gathered his evidence or whether it was uh, uh, legitimate, as um, my colleague uh, said. Um, I also want to make one minor point that just kind of gets in my crawl. Mr. Hoti did not trespass on uh, um, Tesla's property. Tesla has a showroom there, and the public is invited to come and look at cars at that showroom. Uh, he was on that property that's open to the public, and when he was asked to leave, he left, and he's never returned. Um, and similarly, Mr. Hoti never engaged in any harassment. Um, there are a whole long list of uh, uh, items that uh, Mr. Musk claims were harassing um, in his reply brief, and they involved things like basically the the collection of the, the data that Mr. Uh, Hoti engaged in. There's never been a claim by any employee that Mr. Uh, um, Hoti harassed anyone. Mr. It's Hoti, just, I'm it's, sorry, did Mr. Hoti install cameras? He, he did. They were on... Um, my understanding is that they were on property outside of Tesla, pointed in. And the purpose of that was not to um, monitor employees or harass employees. He was counting how many cars were coming off of the uh, um, production line. And he had an interest in that, and, and, and that was where his concern was. And I'm going to – I'm going to – one other overall picture here, um, and that is Mr. Musk says in the very opening paragraphs of his uh, um, brief to this court that the anti slap statute was designed to protect uh, Mr. Musk from uh, claims like this. And that's it's just not the case. Um, the anti slap statute was to protect people who are sh tried to be shut down uh, by big corporations when they're trying to critique corporations. Mr. Musk, who is now not only the richest man, but also Times Man of the Year and a host of Saturday Night Live, certainly has access to uh, um, the media and the public and, and can present his points of view. Um, so, are there other questions that you did, did any of the justice specifically would like me to point to, or shall I address a couple of other minor issues that don't seem to? Um, I don't. Have any questions? Let me ask the panel if they have any questions. No, thank you. I don't. No, I think we're I think we're satisfied. So, if I, you I'll are, submit on the papers then, Your Honors. All right. Thank you. Well, then we'll go back to Mr. Uh, Lifrek if you want to yes. finish this up. Yeah, just very briefly in response, the, the Nadal case uh, was an issue about a university building something in a public park, and that was the public debate. The university then made statements that the protesters had engaged in an incited violence. And if we look at that under the lens that the trial court here did, that that's, those statements by the university wouldn't be protected because they were about not the public issue of whether these things should be built in the park, but they were about the protesters themselves, just like Mr. Musk's comments here were about Mr. Hothi. And so what the court there said is that the relevant question is whether the comments were germane to the persons 
participation in the debate. And here, in this case, Mr. Musk's comments were very relevant to Mr. Hothi's participation in the debate, what he did, and whether his methods were legitimate or not. As to the issue of Mr. Hothi making his statements prior in time, that is also correct. But as the court will note in Mr. Greenspan's email that preceded Mr. Musk's, he raises the issue of Mr. Hothi and his supposed work on the factory output. So he was responding directly to Mr. Greenspan, making a point about Mr. Hothi and his work on the factory output. And in terms of harassment, as the court noted, there was extensive evidence of harassment as that term is normally used, which is what the court should look at, because there were uninvited visits. There was tracking and following of employees. And under the ordinary definition of that word is to annoy or to engage in unwelcome conduct. And Mr. Hothi certainly did that. And as to the final point, as in terms of the purpose of the anti-SLAPP statute, and I started saying this before, but, and I'm paraphrasing Thomas Jefferson, but he said that there are many avenues to the truth and they should all be open. And in this case, Mr. Musk decided to respond to Mr. Hothi in the way that he did in order to raise issues and raise questions about the work that he had done. And that should be protected just like Mr. Hothi's original statement should be. And with that, I'd submit. All right. Are there any other questions related to Thomas Jefferson or otherwise? Not to Thomas Jefferson, but to the Nadell case. Mr. Lifrak, I noticed that case came out in 1994. Would the court have considered things the same way if it had the benefit of the film on Supreme Court's decision that really emphasizes this nexus that we've been discussing? And not just about the, you know, the nature of the speaker in that public debate. I think so. And the difference in the Nadell case is that it was on summary judgment, not on an anti-SLAPP motion to be clear. So it was going to the germaneness point. But I think even under the film on case, you'd be looking at the, obviously the audience, the speaker and the purpose. And as we've set out in the brief, and when you, when you break it down into those issues, this does further the debate because the audience is the general public. The speaker is someone that's a prominent person. And the purpose is to counter these very public attacks that Mr. Hothi had made. Okay. It looks like that should do it. So the case will stand submitted and we will be in recess and we thank you both very much for your argument. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.